TNG used a handful of other Starfleet ships during the show's run, though they were nearly always ships from the original series movie era. The Nebula class is the first clear view we get at a TNG era ship other than the Enterprise D. This video is going to be on that class, which you probably already know since you clicked on the thumbnail. Here we'll hit up the ship's design evolution, trivia with the ship's interior, and pointless observations like quirks with how the ship docks. If you're having fun at any point during the video, please consider dropping a like or subscribing. That'd be much appreciated. You don't tell me how to behave. You're not my mother. Anyhow, let's get going with this look at the Nebula class starship. The Nebula class's life began at the Battle of Wolf 359 from the best of both worlds. Here a handful of ships briefly appeared as smoldering wreckage. They weren't intended to be seen up close, they were basically just set dressing. I covered one of these ships in another video in case you're interested. That's the New Orleans class. Anyhow, what all of these ships had in common was that they were constructed using Enterprise D model parts. A few of these ships had the same basic design as what would eventually become the Nebula class. One of these designs would later appear a few other times in random episodes, like here in this ready room. You can see the basic shape of the saucer with two warp nacelles tucked underneath and a few extra things on top. In this instance, they're smaller warp nacelles. But moving on, similar to the relationship that the Miranda class had with the Constitution class, the Nebula class is a compact galaxy class with the nacelles tucked underneath the saucer. It's basically a hatchback galaxy class. It's the same basic ship with a smaller footprint and more versatility. When it came time for the TNG episode The Wounded, the story called for the Nebula class to be a ship capable enough to take down a Cardassian warship. The series had already featured an Excelsior, Oberth, and Constellation class starships, but those were all original series era movie designs. The Nebula class had to be a newer TNG era design with the curved saucer and more smooth nacelles. The most efficient way to design this ship would be to rearrange Galaxy class parts, otherwise known as kit bashing, and not to be confused with kit bashing. Hey, what's going on here? Oh, that better be bird poop. As you can tell by simply looking at it, they took a Galaxy class, removed the neck, attached the drive section directly underneath, and flipped the pylons into cells. So if the Miranda class and Nebula class were compact variants of the Constitution and Galaxy class respectively, was there a corresponding compact variant of the Sovereign class? What would one of those look like? I know I'm straying off topic, but I'm curious myself, so I'm going to stop recording right here. I'll be back in a few minutes. And I guess it looks like this. Don't really have much else to say about it. Just figured I'd show it. So I'm showing it right here in case you were interested in that sort of thing. The studio model was created using molds of the 4-foot Enterprise D model. You can see the similarities with the hull texture. This is unique to the 4-foot Enterprise model. The 6-foot one had a much smoother hull. Model maker Ed Meyerecki was a key person in designing the initial models for the best of both worlds. Though the usual suspects of Rick Sternbach, Mike Okuda, and Greg Jean refined and finalized the design. While 90% of the model were Galaxy class parts, the aft and dorsal module were 100% original pieces. We'll circle back to that in a moment. First, let's take a look at how the Galaxy class components were modified for this ship. The saucer section had fewer windows, especially on the dorsal side. Here's the Enterprise, where you can see the rows of windows around the rim of the saucer. Now here's that same section on the Nebula class. Obviously, there's fewer windows. The Nebula was intended to be a smaller ship than the Galaxy, but there wasn't enough time to get all the details on the model to convey that. On the ventral side, the deflector is very similar to the Galaxy class. But as you can see, the deflector has a dish piece in the center that's backlit with a blue light, whereas the Enterprise's deflector is made up of rings over a blue backdrop. The Nebula also has a lower slung slackjaw shaped deflector. Hey, what's going on on this side? In this first iteration of the Nebula class, the USS Phoenix has an Apple Magic Mouse on top. It's inspired by the Airborne Warning and Control System, also known as AWACS, which are used on military aircraft as long-range radar. Within the episode, this makes sense, because the Phoenix was able to scan ships deep in Cardassian space when they determined that they were up to do bad stuff to the Federation-type Cardassian stuff, otherwise known as DBS TTF OCS. This top module is held up by two pylons that look like a tacky spoiler. 
Maybe they thought so too because this is the one and only time that this module appeared on the Nebula class. Later appearances of this class featured an arrowhead shaped module, which as far as I can tell housed weaponry. Fire. Gone are the twin pylons. This new module is propped up with a single tower-like piece. This upgrade allowed the ship to fit into this dry dock model for this nice beauty shot. Since the Nebula class saucer is essentially a galaxy class saucer, the main shuttle bay is in the same spot directly behind the bridge. This is fine for the galaxy class which has this wide open space for approaching and departing shuttles. Here on the Nebula class, have fun with this flyboy. The same goes for the observation lounge. Not the best place to negotiate peace with the Cardassians with this giant torpedo launcher pointed at your face. The first interior of the Nebula class we see is the USS Phoenix's ready room, where Captain Maxwell is looking at Enterprise D stock footage. Not now. It's a sparse set that doesn't tell us a lot about the rest of the ship's interior. However, it does tell us that Maxwell is a plant guy. One odd addition is having the Phoenix's dedication plaque in the ready room. We typically see these on the bridge. Maybe the Starfleet Corps of Interior Designers felt that these plants just weren't cutting it. The next Nebula class interior we see is the USS Sutherland's bridge. This is the ship that Data commands during the brief Klingon Civil War. Imagine the worst office environment that you can. No windows, depressing lighting, crappy 90s office chairs. That's even if you get to sit. Imagine having to stand facing your boss all day and put up with some racist guy. I don't think I'd be a good first officer for you. By the same token, I don't think an android is a good choice to be captain. Perhaps there is something wrong with you! Now that's your workday aboard the USS Sutherland. It has a miserable view screen as well. The next Nebula class bridge we see is aboard the USS Prometheus. This is the ship that ferries Cisco and crew to some planet Genesis like event. It's another hastily thrown together set, and its captain's chair is a reuse of the USS Sutherlands. The most interesting thing of note on this bridge are these stations. You can see the red padded wrist rests, and on the floor, there's these lights, and then a panel. I'm pretty sure that these sections are reuses of the Enterprise A bridge set. Another view of the Prometheus's interior happens in this scene. O'Brien and Dax are in the airlock between the ship and DS9. Here you can see the red circular DS9 airlock doors. There's also a random civilian walking by which backs up the likelihood that this is DS9. On the other end, through this door you can see the Prometheus's corridor. So the question is, is this airlock part of the ship or part of the station? It makes more sense that this is part of the station since it's designed to accommodate many types of ships. If that's the case, then it means if you walk through the wrong door aboard a Nebula class ship. <laughs> if you're still watching, we've got a few other things to touch upon. The Nebula class had a CG model built. Recall how the physical model was a kit bash of the Enterprise D? The CG model is a digital kit bash. So not to be confused with Kit Bash. That is not a fire hydrant, you flea-ridden furball. The CG Nebula class was constructed using Galaxy class parts. Whereas the physical model had fewer windows on the saucer than the Enterprise D, the CG model matches the Enterprise one for one. The same goes for the secondary hull. The slack jaw deflector is gone and replaced with the exact same shape found on the Galaxy class. The CG model had a few embellishments, such as running lights along the pylons, though nothing too drastic. The physical model made its way into a few movies. It appears at the end of Generations. Here it's heavily refurbished by ILM. In addition to having better lights, the hull was darkened and more detailed. The physical model appeared one final time in First Contact. It's one of the few physical models used in this scene. The Nebula class models survived the various Star Trek auctions for some reason. You'd figure the studio would want to hold on to one of the major Enterprise models, but this Nebula class model remains in possession of Paramount Studios. We've got one final thing. So we see a Nebula class named the USS Prometheus. As some of you may recall, there would later be another ship named USS Prometheus. 
It's the ship that splits into three independent ships. Anyway, when the Romulans hijack the USS Prometheus, it's being pursued by a Nebula-class ship. That's the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, feel free to leave a like and consider subscribing. That'll help me achieve my lifelong dream of having the ninth most popular Star Trek channel on YouTube. I'd like to thank these tacky spoilers for helping support the channel. Thank you to everyone else for swinging by, and I'll catch you in the next video. Data, I think you should just leave. I said leave.